Crazy Samurai 400 vs. 1 is a 2020 Japanese experimental samurai action flick directed by Yuji Shimomura and written by Atsuki Tomori. It stars Tak Sakaguchi as Miyamoto Musashi. It follows said samurai as after assassinating the last in line for leadership of a clan he must flee. However, hunting him at every turn is 400, or so the title claims, enemy soldiers. Well, technically 100 students and 300 mercenaries. Of course, the actual number is 588, which some marketing points out, but here in the West it just says 400. You might be wondering, what makes this film experimental? Well, the entire central fight after the opening and before the ending is one shot. A one shot is when a scene is played through a completion without cutting cameras or switching angles. These are commonly done with fights. Look at London Has Fallen. They can also be used for time lapses like in the TV show Kidding. Occasionally, you get a film like 1917, which is basically one long shot. Though it's actually long, one-shot segments clipped together with clever editing and camera tricks. For some reason, video games have touted being one shot, but that objectively means nothing compared to film or even animation. But that's a discussion for another time. Let's dive into Crazy Samurai 400 vs. 1. Our film begins with Matashi Shiro, Yoshioka, played by Kozei Kimura, being walked through on what to do when the duel begins. We get some rather pointless character building by way of those hiding in ambush. However, given where this film is going, none of this will ever pay off or matter outside of a line of dialogue adding some quote-unquote historical details. I suppose it's worth noting that we see some of the ambushers flee out of fear of their target. Someone with important information walks on set. It's Yosuke Saito playing Kenpo Yoshioka. He fills us in that they have 100 students and 300 mercenaries lying in wait. He also gets creepy with Kento Yamazaki playing Chusuke. Taking him away to get the Griffith treatment, we watch Matashi Shiro follow a butterfly. And so the fight begins. Given that this is literally the entire film, I'll do my best to add meaningful commentary. For starters, we learn two things. One, there will be sword batting. And two, Musashi loves to tap the head. With his current stamina of being fresh, he is able to slice his way through the low-level enemies with ease. While this might look something similar to Samurai Warriors, basic enemies standing there doing nothing included, it kind of mirrors the Arkham or Yakuza games. As he gains combos without being hit, he occasionally does a takedown on one of them sometimes even managing to take out two-in-one takedown. Finally, a boss appears in the form of Nanpo Yochibe, played by I have no idea as his character is not listed on the IMDB page. Nanpo takes a few easily swatted strikes before Musashi finds his weak point. This leads to one of my favorite moves, not because it's accurate to historical sword fighting, but because it gives me a chuckle the two or three times he does it. It's basically a Muso attack. Reaching an abandoned looking building, he goes inside retrieving a container of water. After swinging it around his mouth, he proceeds to spit it on his hands and sword. Okay. The water must have given him a free takedown charge as he eliminates three jobbers. In walks the boss, Shishido Baiken, played by... Akiko Sai, he brings not only some enemy variety, but weapon variety. He even has some funny history with the protagonist. Shame that his death is literally the worst in the film. I legit have no idea how he got like that, or how he was stuck. He only ever used half his weapon. Not to mention, the fight barely lasted 30 seconds. We'll follow this more fighting, pushing further into the abandoned town, and stopping for water and even a new sword. I do like that he inspects it, as if looking at the edge, and for a seal of its creator. Too bad he doesn't try the wiggle test. Weirdly, he once again spits on the blade. After more fighting, we get a bit of stealth, followed by these two nobodies arguing. One is scared, and the other says he'll fuck his wife. To be fair, this leads to a nice bit of character for Musashi after he kills the aggressor. Ah. Yeah. 
We then get the bridge boss fight with Ude Ryuhai, played by Kazuto Nakamura. It's similar to the first boss fight, and apart from his student's reaction to their sensei's death, it's nothing new. Honestly, they couldn't even have him be knocked over the bridge? Something to make this fight stand out? Stopping for water and a rice cracker, we find one lone child in this abandoned village. His kindness is not rewarded. Stepping out into another street, I'll give this film credit for showing the fighter actually tire over the course of the film. That's probably not so much acting, as it is he's truly getting tired. We enter the final stage, and the problems plaguing this film pile up here. During this entire film, there's been a sense of progress in moving forward that has kept everything flowing. Here, we stay in this one spot for way too long. The repetitive actions are put on clear display, with no movement or environment change to help hide them. Also, the choreography improv begins to suffer. One of the attackers is hit, but the actor fails to realize it. Another actor pulls him back. When this actor is struck, he crawls around, hiding behind the door, waiting for the camera to pan. Meanwhile, his sheath is sticking around the door. One of the attackers has a clear strike that no one was in a position to interfere with. This has happened occasionally throughout the film, but the ones I spot had some degree of room for suspension and disbelief. This one simply does not. Also, the scene is just too fucking long. I mean, Musashi has already exceeded the required KO limit of the level. Can, can we just end this? After killing the last man present, he is confronted by the Grandmaster, Todo Kenji, played by Arata Yamanaka. I think as, once again, IMDb fails and misspells his name. Or the translators used for distribution here failed. I don't know, let's just get this over with. It's another unarmored sword fight, but at the very least, it's the most interesting one, even has some actual back and forth between the two fighters. Attacks are different from what we've seen up to this point, and in moments I think almost result in hits that come close that weren't supposed to be that close. But eventually he does get killed. Ironically, this boss's weak point was the opposite of the first boss's weak point. As the rain stops, we end on one final NPC charge. Cutting ahead seven years, we find Musashi sitting peacefully. Well, he was until Chisuke showed up with a bunch of cannon fodder. Seems in the seven years of being the sock for the cock, he's back to get his revenge. Well, until Musashi whips out the small war scythe. After some actually really good choreography, we end on the title. I couldn't find any exact numbers on the budget or income for the film. However, the 77-minute fight sequence was shot in 2011. The project would then sit as just raw footage for nine years. Come 2018, and with crowdfunding from the site Campfire, they managed to raid 7,818,500 yen, which equates roughly to $58,651.26. This went towards shooting the beginning and ending scene, as well as various post-production and marketing. The final product was completed and shipped in 2020. That said, the life of this film goes back just a bit further. Director Sion Sono was supposed to make a production called Kenkichi, which ultimately fell through. It was to be a 10-minute one-shot fight scene. Ironically, the seven years later scene was filmed more than eight years after the initial 77-minute one-shot. The stuntmen utilized were from the film Kenkichi after Sagaguchi convinced the director to do a longer feature film, and thus him and the stuntmen spent eight months practicing the 77-minute fight. Despite this, injuries were sustained by the end of filming Sakaguchi had one broken rib, one broken finger, and four broken teeth. While I'm not entirely sure, I think that bit of him checking his hand was him actually discovering he broke his finger. Sadly, this was actor Yosuke Saito's final feature film. He would die less than a month after the theatrical premiere. This film is mainly known under two names. The version I received here in the States is Crazy Samurai 400 vs. 1, while other versions are Crazy Samurai Musashi. The first public appearance of this film was in Canada, 20th of August, 2020, at Fantasia Film Festival. Then a Japanese theatrical release a day later. Finally, it hit the States via digital and physical markets, 2nd of March, 2021. One disappointment of this film is its lack of context for just about everything. Even at the end, when asked why, he basically just says because he can. However, a quick look at history reveals a Samurai Age Hatfield and McCoy situation. It all starts with Yoshioka Ryu. This is a style of sword fighting popularized in the latter half of the 16th century when its founder, Yoshioka Kenpo, became sword instructor of the Ashikaga Shoguns in Kyoto. 
He and his family previously were known for their dye works prior to this. The family's fate would take a dark turn when the founder was accidentally struck by a null actor in the Shogun's castle. Feeling embarrassed and disgraced over being unable to defend himself, he fled the area, only to return with a hidden weapon under his clothes. He then killed the actor, and since usage of a weapon in that area was illegal to the point of death, he fled, supposedly killing most of his pursuers before he himself was eventually killed. However, his teachings and fencing school would live on for about four more generations. Somewhere between 1546 to 1565, Shogun Ashikaga Yoshitiru held a comparison fight between Yoshioka and Shinmin Munasai, father of Miyamoto Musashi. Shinmin would win the fight 2 to 1, and this would put a fierce rivalry between the two families. Years later, in his 20s, Musashi would challenge the head of the school, Yoshioka Sajiro. Beating him, he'd then be challenged and beat the brother, Yoshioka Denshichiro. With two defeats, this brought shame and embarrassment to not only their names, but to their fencing school as well. With revenge on their mind, they would challenge Musashi once again, this time with 12-year-old Yoshioka Matashichiro. However, due to his age, his dual participation was more figureheaded, as someone else from the school would fight as his proxy. This duel was to take place at Ichijoji Temple, specifically at the base of Sagarimatsu Tree in northeastern Kyoto. However, this duel was a tramp consisting of 72 men, made up of swordsmen, archers, and even some muskets. During his two prior duels, he had arrived late. However, this time, suspecting wrongdoing, he arrived early and managed to assassinate his figurehead opponent. What followed is a mix of reports. Some say he killed 60 men, others say he killed half of the men, and one even said all his attackers died. The only thing for certain I can say is they made fun of this in the film, with him remarking on how he thought they only had 70 or so men. Following this, the Yoshioka family continued their fencing school, but it was failing due to the multiple defeats and the humiliation they brought. Their last blaze of glory would be in 1614 with Hideyoshi Hideyori at the winter campaign of the Siege of Osaka Castle. Shutting down the fencing school, the family once more returned to dye work. Today, the Yoshioka family is one of the most thought after and prestigious silk dyers in Kyoto. I guess do what you're good at. Also, ironically, there's less dyeing in the dye industry. Now, there's a fair bit of mystery surrounding the figures involved with all of this, so a grain of salt should be taken. That being said, for a European equivalent, this Musashi fellow seems like Fiore de Libri, who was an Italian weapons master. Did he fight 400 men? No. Did he do 60 plus duels to the death and win? Apparently so. I mentioned the oddity of the spitting, and well, there seems to be an answer, but I'm still confused. Essentially, from what I've gathered, to make the suka, the grip, less likely to slip, and make the bamboo peg, makugi, holding the tang, expand. The two liquids of choice are water and sake. This first off raises the question of why he deliberately spits on the blade itself, sometimes ignoring the handle. Also, I found no evidence of this being done outside of games and movies. Maybe I'm missing something, maybe Metatron will make a video saying how this is a true power of the katana. I don't know, I just know it looks stupid, and I don't have faith in the claims surrounding this. I don't know, it just sounds like some bullshito to my HEMA-wired brain. Okay, enough of the history lesson fact-checking, what did I think of the movie? Well, it was experimental. To be completely fair, the film is capable of keeping a continually moving pace, at least up until the final fight. That said, it is a complete success. The constant batting of sword and repeat moves did grow tiring to watch. I do believe that perhaps some more capable martial artists would have been better for some improv attacks. Now, as I understand it, kendo is a Japanese equivalent of Olympic fencing, but kenjutsu is the Hima equivalent. Basically, one is historical, the other very filtered for sports. I think a lot of the choreography is based off kendo, however loosely. I don't know, I just think that reaching out to actual practitioners would have allowed for more variation to be put on display. Even more trained HEMA practitioners would have been a decent choice since there is a level of crossover. I will admit I have one significant dislike of Kendo and that's the lack of afterblows being accounted for in their tournaments slash sparring. 
that's a discussion for a different time, but in short, you don't want to hit and be hit, you want to hit and not be hit. But hey, it is what it is, and on principle alone, one must acknowledge the impressiveness of a 77-minute one-shot fight scene. It's simply a feat not done by really any others to this scale, save for the 2015 film Victoria, which is two plus hours long. Now you start to notice a lot of repeat faces and actors crawling off screen to simply reappear later. Sometimes this disappearance can last a few minutes, other times seconds. Some critics have said you can't hire 500 guys, but that's been done to impressive degree in films like A Bridge Too Far and also the excellent Waterloo. Of course, in the latter, he rented a chunk of the Russian army. One reason for the CGI may have been because of the actor rotation. Due to the small-ish size, it would prove difficult to use blood packs at any point due to the actor then needing to swap clothes quickly well off camera. That may have been preferable even on a main character in just small portion, as he's essentially never touched. One of my significant problems came down to the lack of variety, especially with the bosses. One came with a comma attached via chain to a metal ball. Okay, that's cool. However, it was over in mere seconds. Also, the three other bosses just had katanas. You couldn't give one a spear and maybe have another wear armor. I mean, the final one is fair, as it's one of the genre's styles but nothing felt unique as they only lasted a bit longer than their cannon fodder allies. The sets themselves looked fine, but were too lifeless to then have some random girl within them. This is a movie to collect as a unique piece of the art form, but where something like Hardcore Henry managed to be unique while also being an enjoyable film, this one falls short. Will it ever be beaten? I cannot say, as if we keep it in the category of 60 plus minute one shot, it probably never will. But if we compare it to other one-shots, I think we can say the quality and expertise did it better elsewhere. Of course, those films had actual stories within them to push the characters and events and for us to lash onto. Crazy Samurai 400 vs. 1 is a film that, while unique, does so at its own detriment. I simply cannot suggest this film to the average audience, and even lovers of the film, choreography, action, or even samurai flicks will find themselves tested. Maybe one day this could be revisited by more trained martial artists, but until then, remember that unlike in video games, children dying may be the better outcome. And now folks, it's time to say goodnight. We sincerely appreciate your patronage and hope we've succeeded in bringing you an enjoyable evening of entertainment. Please drive home carefully and come back again soon. Good night.